as well. So I'm going to talk about um, pain management and residential care for the first part of the talk. And our second present, uh, talk is going to be end of life care because that you're all going to deal with this all the time. And I want to share some of my experience. And, and the cases I'm going to present to you are, are real cases. And they're cases, very recent cases. Two of the cases are very, very recent cases. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare that I'm aware of. And uh, we're going to launch into case number one. And um, this is a guy who was actually just admitted into a facility fairly recently. He's a 92-year-old, very talented graphic artist. He has six of his students, women, they call them Charlie's Angels, uh, Fr actually Fred's Angels, who dote on him and look after him and have been looking after him in the community because I do home-based care. That's the majority of my care is home-based care for the last 10 years. And um, he was recently transferred from hospital, uh, f uh, from home via hospital to nursing home and was admitted with severe immobility, no longer able to manage in his home with maximal support. So it was basically the bridge finally collapsed. And uh, you know, even with Fred's Angels and all the supports he had in place, they can no longer manage this guy because he needed a lift and it was impossible you know, uh, to manage him in the home anymore. In his functional status, he needed a lift for transfers. He was wheelchair mobility. He was dependent for his dressing and bathing. He needed pads for protection, so he could get to the toilet if he can get there on time, but he did need pads. He had severe constipation, and um, he was terrified of constipation. He needed impaction once in his life, and it's a recurrent nightmare for him. Uh, he was very depressed about not being able to go home, that he'd sort of reached the final frontier in his life. And um, there were no problems prior to coming into the nursing home that I was aware of with cognition, no visual impairment. And I got a fax from a nurse. This was my first visit to see this gentleman. Um, and I, I knew him from the community. And he went to one f went to hospital, went to one facility, then was transferred to the facility I go to. And, um, and this was, I got a fax from a nurse, please come and assess him for pain. He's refusing to take his dilaudid, and, uh, he, uh, or any analgesia for that matter. And um, when I spoke to the nurse, he said he's phobic about constipation. And he's also, please assess his mood, he's also very depressed and he's a bit confused. And I know this man. He was not on any uh, hydromorphone before he went into the hospital. And he um, was not depressed. You know, he had stable depression, he was treated with phenylephaxine. And he was 100% with a copus mentis cognitively. Past medical history included some macular degeneration. I mentioned the depression and anxiety. He'd had a cerebellar stroke, which affected his mobility. He'd had post-herpetic neuralgia in his right hand, which was no longer an issue. He wore a glove for it, and that took care of it. That was the end of it for him. Uh, he had GERD and had had an NSAID-induced GI bleed. He had BPH, and he had significant OA in his spine with spinal stenosis and radiculopathy. And the radiculopathy was not an issue. It was more he had some chronic uh, back pain, which uh, prior to coming into the facility, and this is the advantage when you know people before, is he just took Tylenol, and that's all he wanted, and it was enough for him. And he'd had skin cancer, and he needed radiotherapy to his face on a couple of occasions for that. <coughs> when, before he went into the hospital, he was just on the venlafaxine, and he was on pantoprazole, and he was on uh, bowel protocol at home, and that was it. And, and he took acetaminophen a couple times a day if he needed it. Um, and when he came out of hospital, he was on baclofen, 5 milligrams TID, uh, gabapentin, 300 TID, dilated 2 milligrams QI, uh, QID. And he was also 90% of people who are over the age of 80 who come out of hospital come out on ketiapine. And he was on ketiapine, 12.5 milligrams um, HS. What are you thinking about this gentleman? And what, uh, what are we going to do for him? So what do you guys think? What are his problems? Tell us about okay. his pain. Pain? Okay. Pain, anything else? Confusion. What are you thinking? What's going through your mind? What are you doing this guy? He was on the lot and he said, I'm not touching this stuff anymore. You know, I don't like what it makes, the way it makes me feel. You know, goals of care. Goals of care. Good. So Use goals. a tool. Use a tool. Okay, what Sorry, tool? I didn't, what? I didn't hear that. Use a tool. What tools would you guys use? Remember the tool I spent all morning about it? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you calling a tool? <laughs> um, so what tools could we use? Like, first of all, I guess we want to assess what is his pain, right? That's a starting point. I think we're doctors. 
we do assessments, right? Nurses do assessments, doctors do assessments. Am I going to fax back? Would you fax a prescription back, say, okay, give them this drug, this less constipating? No. Good. Okay. So let's do pain history. And, you know, you, Christina's given us some excellent tools to use you know, for this. And I the body map picture. Um, for him, this guy's a graphic artist. It would have been pretty cool to see what he drew <laughs> for his body map. So I'm going to give you a verbal body map picture for this guy. So when I went to ask him to speak to him about his pain, he really had a number of different pains. And this is what you're going to see with this population. It's very unusual to have one pain only, you know, in this, in this group of people. So what was your worst pain? It was my neck pain radiating to his right ear. And that was every day. The other pain he had, he says, I can't sit. You know, and why can't you sit? It hurts like hell whenever I'm sitting, and I can't sit, and I can't use my computer, which is even worse, because he was always on email with everybody, and he was, he was still doing graphic artists on the computer, you know, so that was number two on his list of pain. Third thing, he says, I can't sleep at night, and why couldn't he sleep at night? Because my heels are killing me for the pressure he had to cubit eye starting on his heel uh, from lying at night, which not only caused him pain, but stopped him from sleeping, so he was pretty crabby the next day because he had insomnia despite his, you know, PRN catiapines and other. And the fourth pain he said is he said that he had osteoarthritis, he had pain in his right knee that had flared and um, it was whenever he moved. He, you know, whenever they transferred him or used the lift or he couldn't put weight on that right knee because of pain. And then his last pain he said, and there's always the back pain, right, that I've had for the last 40 years or 50 years as long as he's had it. But that pain did not radiate down his leg. There was no radicular component at all to the pain. And, and examining him, again, I stripped him down and looked. He had a decubitus on his coccyx, you know, uh, it was uh, stage one plus redness, you know, that wasn't blanching at all. And he had some OA in his neck, you know, with some radiation into his ear. And um, he had a, a OA changes in his knee, right? And he has, we knew about the chronic back pain. Okay, so. Again, we're doctors, you go and, you know, sometimes in this facility it's a challenge because you have to get someone in to help get him and look at his back end. No one had looked at his back end, or at least reported in the chart that he had the cubitus, and no one also has his heels, you know, that were causing pain. The other issues with this fellow were, and if you, we did visual analog scales on him, I forgot what the scores were, but, you know, they were in the range, the neck was probably about a six or a seven, they were all in the range about four to eight in the visual analog scale <coughs> realm of, you know, intensity of pain. And if we think about the pain scales that Christina is talking about, they really serve different purposes, right? The uh, QRST or OPQRSTUV is our assessment. We diagnosed us. What is this pain? Where does it radiate? What, what does it lead us to, etc. The visual analog scale and the McGill pain scale, or the um, uh, the uh, Abbey pain scale are intensity scores, right? How bad is this pain? It doesn't tell us anything diagnostically. It just says how, how intense. And that's really important for gauging what people need and also reass reassessing them afterwards. And the other one, the Edmonton pain scale, would be more, is, you know, helps you a little bit with what's going on, a little bit with intensity, and also on impact. How does it affect your mood? How does it affect your function? How, you know, how does it affect your sense of well-being? right? So there, it's not like one or the other. I don't see these pain scales one or the other, but they're doing different things in helping us. So his other issues that he complained of was he was depressed. He hated being in a facility. In my mind, this was the best facility in town, but there's no facility he would be happy in. Um, he was a very independent-minded guy. He was mentally slowed, and he hated the fact that he was mentally slowed. So every time I take that morphine, you know, I just can't think. I can't concentrate. And uh, he said, I can't read. You know, I've got macular degeneration. My vision is more blurred. I couldn't see the computer screen. And he said, he said and, and I was constipated, even though he was on bowel protocol. And I, I'm not going there again. I've been there, and I'm not going there with the constipation. So this brings us to our goals of care that we've been talking about in most of these torch sessions, right? And when, the way I look at goals of care is I look at the symptoms. I look at the function. I look at the caregiver function too, you know, as a goal of care because they're really linked together. And then what do they want in terms of their health care and, and finally mortality, you know, death, you know, how important is that? So his goals of care, he said, ah, it would be really nice if I can move my neck without having it 
radiate into the, into my ear so I could see the computer. It says I want to be able to, you know, I, I need to, um, um, the buttock pain is a problem because I can't sit, I can't sleep because of my heels. Um, I'm uh, terrified of the constipation and I'm really scared. I think I'm constipated now and dopiness. Those are the symptoms he was concerned about in order of his priorities, and I asked him, you rank, you tell me the ranking. What's your most, number one? You know, let's go through these things. And there's a number of problems there, it's not one. The other is, in terms of function, what do you want to be able to do? He said, I'd like to be able to read again. I'm dying here, I'm bored out of my mind. I don't like it here, I don't like the food here. And on top of that, I'm, you know, I can't read, I can't use my computer, and I can't draw. So functionally, this was important to this gentleman, right? Um, the other thing, his, his goal of care was he couldn't stand the food there. And this guy, like he had gourmet food every day. People would prepare him arugula salad and you know, stuff. I mean, I'm going to be terrible when I go into a facility because I'm so fun. I love my food too. You know, I'm a foodie. And, um, you know, when they served up this mush to him, he just was revolting. He stopped eating. Plus, with the narcotic, his appetite was reduced. <clears throat> and finally, in terms of his health care, he said, I ain't going back to hospital except in a casket. Okay. What are we going to do with this gentleman? Any ideas now? How would we frame now in terms of how are we going to manage his pain? Goals of care. Anyone have any ideas? Amanda? Go back to the last one. The previous one? Sure. And show the previous, mm -hmm. sorry. Okay. So what would we do? How would people, we'll leave this slide up and ask, does anyone have any ideas? How would we approach his pain? Why don't we look at his goals and work through the list? Mm -hmm. You brought up that he's on a bunch of medications that he wasn't on previously. Yes. So mm -hmm. that might be, in terms of dealing with his confusion and inability to read, you might want to look at some of those and see what you can take away. Okay. So, Jeff, what would you suggest? Well, I'm wondering about the, uh, you said the cotiapine and it's not going to. It's not going to address all the pain, the symptom issues necessarily. But okay. So okay. typing, definitely, mm -hmm. because it can cause sleepiness the next day, right? And so good time mental. And, and mental slowing. Yeah. Well, I would say also the uh, targeting um, skin care, uh, nursing wise, if he's got uh, you know compromised uh, areas on his heels and his buttocks. Then Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which is the best treatment for the cubitus? Is it more relief? Relief. 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 relief? Exactly. Yeah. Right? So perfect. Carol, perfect. Nursing care, right? Mm -hmm. And and sometimes with the nurses, is there anyone else that could help a nurse? Because this guy is very mobile. Sorry? OT. The OTs are brilliant at the surfaces and supports mm -hmm. and positioning and care planning. Exactly. It's like so you know, just taking the heel off the bed. Mm -hmm. For people, often within a day, they don't have pain. The pain is gone. And, and dealing with the cubit eye, which can be terrible and a terrible way to end your life, you know, with these, especially if it goes to full ulceration. Um, um, you know, just by changing the seating, right, and the positioning, and in both when people are in their chairs, so that they're not loaded on their coccyx and on their ischia. And when they're in at bedtime, sometimes they put the feet up in this way, that, and then you just load everything onto that coccyx. And that's where an OT, the expertise of an OT is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And good nursing care is well for people. Any other suggestions? So that's what we haven't even touched. Yeah. So we're stopping catiopy. Is there I any know. other drugs that you think I would say look at baclofen and say, what is baclofen treating? Right. Yeah. What's baclofen used mm -hmm. for? Spasticity, right? Spasticity. Does this guy have spasticity? Mm -hmm. He has cerebellar stroke, but he didn't have any spasticity. Okay. So what is baclofen? What's the side effect from baclofen? Sedation. Pardon me? Sedation. Sedation. Exactly. You know, it's cognitive impairment, which to him were, that was, you know, got the cognitive impairment. Oh, it's not on the list, but it was death, dopiness, cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. That was big, that was on his list. So I would say, is the baclofen contributing? Any? And baclofen can be constipating too. So is the baclofen contributing any, anything? So that's something we could withdraw. Do would you ever stop baclofen cold turkey? No. There is a withdrawal syndrome from it, to my understanding. Mm -hmm. So again, with a good rule of thumb, with anything unless it's a crisis, taper people off it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other drugs you would think of stopping with him? Could you could you put those up? Mm -hmm. The drugs. Sorry. Yeah, I should have put that. I'm sorry about that. Let's go back a couple. Gosh, I can go. Arrow key. Where's the arrow key? 
There's no marijuana. Hmm. There we go. Any other drugs you think may be contributing to his symptoms? The gabapentin. Gabapentin. Mm -hmm. Right. What's gabapentin good for? Neuropathic pain. Yeah, yeah. Did he have any neuropathic pain? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's had decubitus head pressure. He had OA pain. His knee was hurting. Now, it could be the gabapentin was treating the pain, and that's why he didn't have the pain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible it was doing something. But what are the side effects from gabapentin? Rosiness. Rosiness. Exactly, exactly. And the edema could be a significant issue with mm -hmm. older people. Significant issue, right? <coughs> Good. Excellent. So, there's my arrow key. Good. So, any other, do people have any other suggestions that we can deal to knock through our list here? So, we're getting rid of some of the pills. We're getting the nurse, we're going to talk to the nurse about positioning. Um, we're going to get an belt. Anything else we can do for this gentleman that you can think of? Amanda? Perfect. Perfect. So we could use topical diclofenac, right? And over here, over here, just have give him a diclofenac bath. <laughs> but um, so topical diclofenac is an excellent idea, um, and injection is an excellent idea. Would you, you know, what would you inject? His neck or his knee or both? I wouldn't be comfortable doing his neck. Good. Good. You just, you almost lost your license. Good, well done. So, that, yeah, I wouldn't do his neck, you know, but certainly we could do his knee, and it's dead easy to do a knee. You know, so 40 milligrams of Kenalog, you know, it's, it's so easy to do it. You don't need fluoro, and it's as simple to do it. Okay, excellent. So anyone, how, what else could you use? You mentioned the constipation, and we've given him the diclofenac. Let's assume we've, you know, smeared it everywhere and has, um, uh, you know, given, given him an injection. He's still got pain. Any other painkillers? I, I mean, I put like a dosage of Tylenol. It doesn't say what it is. Okay, and like he was maxed in. out. <clears throat> he was on, we're going to say, for the sake of argument, four grams. I don't go, I usually go up to three grams in this population. But let's say he was on it and he still had pain. I would use some topical uh, medications to his uh, heel and, and buttock. Okay. And think to keep this. Okay, what kind of topicals, Christine, would you use? Um, for the decubitus, um, you could just use topical morphine. There's very little absor systemic absorption with it. But we have a recipe that we love um, that has ketamine and lidocaine in it. And we just mix the ketamine, lidocaine, and morphine, mix it up in a spray bottle, and spray it on either fungating wounds or decubitus ulcers. And um, it uh, works very well. So ketamine is very good for allodynia, especially when there's hypersensitivity, because it disconnects the brain, my understanding, to the, and you can compound that into a cream, you know, ketamine, or, or put it on. Um, and lidocaine, I use a lot of topical lidocaine. Now, I'm a little bit, and I do use on decubitus, but again, if you take away the sensation, people don't shift their weight at all. So you have to be a little cautious with it. I, you know, I would go one step before that even. I use two inches of penitent. Right, which is superb zinc oxide, and it's paste, you know, to put on those decubitus areas, and people feels better. You know, I, I use lidocaine too. You know, but it's something to, to think of. So, any other? What about? We've still done that, and he's got pain. What about? I mean, it's probably not going to be sufficient in his case, but uh, nobody's mentioned non-pharmacologic measures. So, something as simple as heat, uh, something like that, might give sure. some relief of his neck. Excellent. So bean bags, yeah. Throw them in the microwave, put it on. They're great. And you see, I said, and be very careful with hot water bottles. I had a lady this week mm -hmm. with burns all over her back because she just had it, yeah. and then a lady with burns all over her stomach. You know, lividew. It looked like lividew, you know, all mm -hmm. over her stomach. Um, and then going on from there, in terms of medications, uh, switching things up to a less lesser constipating agent like uh, tramadol, or, or tramadol, if he's already mentioned on the table. Um, and also addressing the bowel issues. Uh, I mean, if he's a foodie, maybe even if he likes prunes, I don't know, rather than necessarily a, a prescription. Mm -hmm. The prunes have to be sprinkled with desiccated coconut. 
<laughs> Good, excellent. So I'll tell you what I did with this gentleman. No. Um, and I started him on six micrograms. You know, he's, he was on Dilaudid so I could theoretically get away with the fentanyl naive issue, even though he stopped taking it, you know, five days before or seven days before. Um, buprenorphine is not covered, and this guy was, did not want to spend one penny out of his pocket because, you know, he was a veteran and everything must be paid through by Veterans Affairs. That was his, the way he, that's just his mindset. He had a ton of money, but he, he wasn't going to. And um, so we use fentanyl, and I start people, I do start no opiate-naive people sometimes on fentanyl patches, I confess. Stop the microphone. But it does, <laughs> but, um, and, and the, way, the way I do it is I start them on six micrograms, and I wait for one or two patches before I go up. And, you know, they've got, had this pain for months anyways, to be extra cautious, and then I'll go up to 12 micrograms. And 12 micrograms, that's where he went up to. Now, I used a compound, I find for OA of the neck, when people get that ridiculous radiating kind of pain, amitriptyline is a beautiful thing, okay? And so I often will use 5% diclofenac, and I will put in 2% amitriptyline, sometimes lidocaine, and if there's spasm in the neck, I'll use baclofen, you know, which is more expensive. That increases the cost of the compounding significantly from $50 a month up to over $100 a month. But if you remember nothing, amitriptyline you don't need as much of, um, and it is absorbed. Um, so, you know, if you just think of the 5% rule, you know, 5%, 5%, 5%, that's generally pretty safe. But, you know, I, I started with 2% amitriptyline with him. And it took his, it was gone, his pain was gone. And this, this was after we failed on Voltaren, on 5% Voltaren, okay? <coughs> Which is a lot cheaper. Sorry? Yeah, so I, I let the pharmacist decide what's the best vehicle when you start. Generally, flow gel is the base for diclofenac. But there, you, you have to use different ones for different drugs. So I say you decide, you know, which is the best one. TID. And uh, we use this TID, yes. You can use a BID or TID. And as effective on other joints? Well, again, this is for a combination of OA plus a radicular pain. Amitriptyline is a great neuropathic pain agent. I use the same compounded one. I use a little slightly different for people with diabetic neuropathy in their feet who have severe pain or peripheral neuropathy. Amitriptyline, topical, lidocaine, diclofenac, put on your feet at nighttime. It's great. And there's no side effects. 5% of lidocaine? And I'll use 5% lidocaine, yeah. So I don't use baclofen if there's, I use the baclofen when there's spasm in the muscle too. Mm -hmm. And we um, had tried 5% diclofenac on his knee and it gave, gave him a suboptimal response. I inject his knee and his knee was better. It's gone. You know, it's much, much better. Um, and we got OT and nursing, as everyone has suggested. We got his seating better, his bed better. Don't underestimate the importance of a pillow. And I speak from experience. I was getting neck pain for about uh, six months of just, ah, my neck felt terrible. And finally, someone said to me, one of my patients said that, um, that they got a new pillow and their neck pain went away. I learned so much from my patients. <laughs> so I ran to sleep country, got a new pillow, and my neck pain was gone. Right, and those old pillows that do not support your neck. Something simple like a pillow will take away people's neck pain. We put a lift under his calves to prevent contact of heels on his bed and, he, and heel boots as well. <coughs> we tapered him off the dilaudid. Theoretically, he wasn't even using it. We didn't taper the dilaudid. He'd stopped it on his own. We tapered off the baclofen, off the gabapentin, and stopped the catiapine. And we got him to order in Chinese food three times a week. And he was happier with that, because that was his goal of care, right? He couldn't stand the food, and his appetite was an issue. So I didn't need to use anti-nauseants with him. He was getting food that he enjoyed. And reassessed him a month later and asked, how's your pain? And he said, what pain? What doesn't happen very often, but this was a case of what pain? And I said, your neck, oh, that's a lot better, and my buttock is better. You know, and things were better, but it wasn't on his radar, you know, whereas before it was front and center, and I was getting facts from the nurse. He was sleeping well, he was mentally clearer, his bowels were moving regularly, and he still wanted to go home. So, and he's still on the phone. Yeah, and this is a very recent case. This was, you know, this was my, this guy was over March and April. Mm -hmm. Okay? Kim Northcott recommends uh, 80 to 120 milligrams of Kimberlock for a knee. I use 40, 40 <coughs> all the time. That's just too well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 40. These are, 
tiny, you know, osteoarthritic knees, and, 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 you know, if someone fails on 40, you could think about going back and doing 80, or ask yourself, but if you're in a knee joint, 70% of the time, it's effective. I use 40. For, again, old people. And remember, 80 milligrams of Kenalog is going to be absorbed. It doesn't just stay in the knee. It gets absorbed as well. Sorry? Injecting knees. I've never been done enough of them to be very... Confident. I don't use lidocaine. I go straight in. I use, a, I use the small, the blue needle, which is that 25 Five, gauge, 25 gauge needle, one inch. And I say, which side is easier to get into? You know, where can I, and I push the patella, which one, where does it slide easier, to the left, you know, or to the right, medial or laterally? Mm -hmm. I'll push the patella over, you know, I'll prep it, you know, properly, with, I'll use chlorhexidine swaps, and I just go right under the patella, you know, superior, you know, superior under the patella. And I would say, I hit, you know, I'm in. And, you know, people are always shocked, not always. They say, that's it. And they're so fearful about having a mm -hmm. joint injection. Mm -hmm. Never use a large needle. You don't need to. Mm -hmm. The catalog will go through a small 25-gauge needle. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be afraid to. And, you know, it's not going to help everybody. But for a lot of people, you know, it's, it will give them pain control for I've had some people twice a year. In. Okay. We're going to go on to case number two. <coughs> and this is a slightly different case. This was gentleman who was a retired miner, forestry worker. He never married, had no family, and he was admitted into the facility with mild dementia, who was not managing in the community, immobility and falls, increased dependency with his dressing and bathing, he had very poor flexibility, um, and he had chronic pain, and he had no previous continuity of care. He, he went to walk-in clinics, and there was no medical history. So this is someone you're going to see in your facilities you know, from time to time, with very poor histories, very poor documentation. So after assessing this guy, his goals of care, we're going to go right to his goals of care for the interest of time. He said, take away my pain. I cannot live like this. I'm miserable. Kill me. Shoot me. And when we asked about his pain, his pain assessment, he had pain in his hands, in his shoulders, in his knees. It was worse in the morning, and it was slightly better in the afternoon. What does that tell you? What's, what type of pain is that? No. What's a, what kind of pain is bad in the morning and gets better as the day goes on? Oh, it gets worse. Inflammatory. Inflammatory. Think inflammatory. And we're going to come to, because it's really important because the treatment is very different. So this guy had inflammatory pain in his hands, in his shoulders, in his knees. He was taken for every, and morning stiffness lasted till after lunch. Okay, that's a, boom, you know, a signal right, that there's something going on. His back hurt him all the time. He had shooting pain down his leg, and he had his pain, severe pain in his leg at night, and he had to get up. He couldn't get up, but he had to move, you know, all night long. What do you think of when someone tells you that? Okay, so you've got shooting pain down his leg, but when someone says that my calves are aching, I can't get comfortable, and I've got to get up and move. Sorry? Yeah. Because this guy had restless legs. So we've got inflammatory pain, number one. We've got back pain, I'm not sure what that is yet, but probably it's unusual for rheumatoid arthritis to affect the back. Ankylosing spondylitis does, but maybe osteoarthritis or a vertebral fracture. He's got shooting pain down his leg, so back and leg make me think more of OA or spinal stenosis with radiculopathy. And he's got another pain, he's got pain in his at nighttime, right? So radiculopathy isn't just at nighttime, you know. And it, which, it, which is probably restless legs. The second problem in his symptoms, besides pain, was I cannot concentrate. Can't play crib. My memory is poor. I can't read. Can't watch TV. I just want to sleep all the time. He felt very nauseated. He didn't enjoy his food. His uh, other symptom, he said, help me with my bowels. I'm bloated all the time. I'm constipated. I have pain in my abdomen from it. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to his sleep, and it comes back to pain number four, was he says, my legs are kicking all night long. You know, and I'm, I keep waking up and my legs are kicking, the sheets are all over the place, and he was exhausted. So functionally, so we have his symptoms. Functionally said, I'd love to walk in the hall again. I don't want Pete to be dependent on people, you know, to get up for assistance with transfers. Um, I feel really weak, I feel unsteady, you know, in this pain. He says, I don't want people wiping my, my bottom. This is the censored version of what he told me. 
And he and to him it was incredibly demeaning having someone help him with his toileting. And finally said that he had this really bad tremor, and it affected his eating. You know, he was embarrassed to eat in front of people because he was shaking and spilling. And in terms of his health care, you know, in, in his health care directive, you know, do you want to go to the hospital or not? He says, do whatever you can to help me. Hospital, why would I not want to go to the hospital? What a stupid question. That's what he said to me, <laughs> right? But there are some people who, you know, that's what they want. They want whatever care they can get that's going to help them. And when I talked to him about CPR, he had a glazed look on his face. <coughs> No, I'm, I'm sort of summarizing a couple of visits. Okay. I don't talk about CPR in the first visit unless it's really critical. Okay. You know, I think someone's dying, you know, soon. But it's a good point you're making. Definitely. I don't, and I've talked about when people are in pain or, you know, in the middle of some kind of crisis, symptom crisis. Um, so this was his medication reconciliation. We're coming back to, remember, multiple comorbidities and multiple medications and turning this into pain. So this is the drug list he had. I when I took over his care. He was on Zoplicone 50HS, which I assumed was for insomnia. He was taking T3s to QID, and he was taking them regularly. He was on Celebrex 100 milligrams BID for pain. Um, sorry, that TES is, that's a mistake. The Q, uh, he wasn't taking the Tylenol. He was taking Tylenol 3 four times a day. Uh, he was on metoclopramide 10 milligrams QID for nausea. Uh, Gravol 50 milligrams QID for nausea. He was on Enterocode AS81 milligrams, which I'm assuming was for stroke prevention or um, MI prevention. He was on oxybutynin and he was on Lasix for edema, 40 milligrams oxybutynin, 5 milligrams TID for urinary incontinence, Senna, Docusate, and Metamucil. Okay, that was his list when I first saw this guy. It's part of my initial assessment with a very scant medical history, you know, attached to it that I could piece together. In his other clinical findings, his MMSE was 22, so he had some mild, you know, he had cognitive impairment, probably mild dementia. He was depressed. His ger short geriatric depression scale was 4 out of 5. I use a 5-point questionnaire for GDS. And anyone who scores more than 1 is a very high correlation with depression. And this was the uh, savage 15-point GDS that was pared down to 5, and it's equally valid and reliable. And I can talk to people about it after if they have any questions about it. He definitely had rheumatoid changes in his hands and his feet, and he had his effusions in his shoulders and effusions in his knees. So that told me this guy has rheumatoid arthritis. He had o o OA in his lumbar spine. There was plus four edema in his legs. They were almost weeping, very tense legs. His blood pressure was 164. His hemoglobin was 100. He had a low ferritin and a low transferrin saturation. His creatinine, and the reason I ordered the transferrin saturation was because he also had CKD, he had chronic renal failure. So the ferritin, you know, the irons may not be as reliable. If it's low, it's low, though. And um, you could see his potassium was slightly elevated. His CRP for inflammation was 33. This guy had an active inflammation. And his rheumatoid factor is negative. Does a negative rheumatoid factor mean no rheumatoid arthritis? Especially in older people. You don't get the rheumatoid factors positive in older people. And his uric acid was normal. So <laughs> is everyone's head spinning yet? Good. Um, what are we going to do for this gentleman? We've sort of he set us up for goals of care, pain and dopiness and constipation. Does anyone have any ideas what you'd like to do for this? The medical provide might be the reason why he has restless, restless leg syndrome. Excellent. Yes. And so that, uh, unless there's a real indication for that, and the gravel as well. Okay. And I don't use metoclopramide very often in older people. It's a good drug for narcotic-induced nausea, but I've seen too many people get permanent tardive dyskinesia from it. In fact, I got a call at the break from a patient in the hospital who has tardive dyskinesia because she was put on max rent for three weeks when she was during a hospital admission five years ago. And she's got this grunting, this respiratory tardive dyskinesia has never gone away, and it never will. So. You know, medical opamide can cause Parkinsonism, it can cause restless leg syndrome, it can cause dyskinesia. 
I do use it and have people with malignant pain getting closely into their lives and, are, and they have nausea, narcotic-induced nausea. Usually I'll start with domperidone, it's less effective, but uh, I would start with domperidone because it doesn't, it's not dopamine, it's, it won't cause a Parkinsonism. <coughs> Any other sort of thoughts about how we would treat this gentleman? How would we treat his pain? So the restless leg syndrome pain will get rid of the max round. Perfect. The inflammatory arthritis, I mean, again, this is controversial, but you, this guy's just arrived and um, you know, a little bit of prednisone can change that dramatically. And, uh, mm. um, you get 10 points. Yeah, because he's got, he's got, so, um, sorry, Chris? He's got PMR. This. He's got root arthritis. His Not PMR is muscles, mm. right? So PMR is arms, shoulders, neck, neck thigh, thighs. His hands are swollen. His knees are swollen. He's got effusions in both shoulders, right? He, and a lot of people have both PMR and RA. They get a combo, zero negative RA. So prednisone is a fantastic drug. I, I love it. Just like she's, you know, geriatrics. I love prednisone. She loves dexamethasone, <laughs> right? Um, prednisone is a great drug, and it, you get immediate relief with it. Right? You can flog this guy with fentanyl and flog him with morphine and flog him with dilaudid, and you are not going to control this pain to the same degree as you will with something like 10 milligrams of prednisone. Okay? Perfect. Anything else you would want to do besides prednisone? Stop the Celebrex. Stop the Celebrex. It wasn't helping him, right? Mm -hmm. And what was it causing? What did Celebrex cause? GI upset. GI upset. This guy's nauseated. Nausea. He's on two drugs for nausea, right? He's, he's probably had an ulcer. Mm -hmm. He's got renal failure. He's got renal, chronic kidney disease, which is going to affect all the other drug metabolism and excretion, right? His potassium is a little bit elevated. Mm -hmm. What else does he have? He had edema, right? He had like plus three edema. It causes flu retention because it's in the kidney. So get rid of the Celebrex. Perfect. Anything else? You could definitely. Uh, Depending on how confident you are about the uh, RA for a patient, you could definitely look at starting a DMARD. Okay. Like one of them. Perfect. What would you start? Start starting what? Uh, sorry, I couldn't a DMARD. A DMARD. Dis disease modifying and traumatic drug. Uh, to be honest, I have no experience ever prescribing them. But, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. so I don't know which one they go so with. So, anyone have, have any experiences? Would anyone have the confidence? And this again, you guys, you need to start. We need to treat under treat our patients. You can always pick up the phone and call one of the rheumatologists if you can get through. Yeah. But there are some drugs you can start them on. They're going to tell you. Yeah. Methotrexate. Methotrexate. Methotrexate is a great drug if you monitor it properly. And I started him on methotrexate right away. I had no doubt in my mind this bad inflammatory arthritis. And the thing with prednisone too is if you're not sure, you can treat them with prednisone first. And if the symptoms don't change, it's unlikely it's inflammatory arthritis. Right? It's almost diagnostic. Right? You know, they're, they're better within a couple of days. So that's what we did with this guy. We put him on the, the steroids. He was a different person. Started him on methotrexate. <clears throat> and the way I handle methotrexate usually, and I've used it a lot, but if you're you call a rheumatologist and say, I've got this guy, he's in a nursing home, he can't come to your office, you know, and you've got an eight month, 10 month wait list. I'm thinking about methotrexate, and I'll go, great. That's their go to, a lot of the people's go to drugs. And you just start the people on 2.5 week one, five milligrams. And I usually go up to 10 milligrams and wait. You know, I'll wait, I'll wait like a month. And if there's not, it's not touching their pain, I'll go up to 15, 12.5, 15. Almost always 15 milligrams is enough in this age group. If people have nausea and GI, I go right to injectable, right? Because you don't get that topical, you know, mucosal damage as much for people. And if we put people on methotrexate, what, what do we need to monitor? Yeah, so immediately you, I put them on CBC, ALT, ALP, and a GFR monthly. You know, and we checked their baseline. You know, if his GFR was a bit low, it, we checked it again off the, these, uh, off the Celebrex, it came right into normal range, his GFR. <coughs> there, is, there is a kind of protocol for starting, and one of them is going to worry about TB. Immunosuppressed. This guy has been everywhere. Yes. You know, so I, I think. Um, so you have chest x ray coming yeah. in here. Yeah. So you have to yeah. think. So we don't, this isn't about methotrexate. You know, I don't want to spend a lot of time. Prednisone plus methotrexate. 
Yeah, so we need to be extra cautious about TB, hepatitis, you know, things like that. But it's something that's effective to meet his goal of care. And if you handle it responsibly, it is very safe. Okay? Another drug you could use would be hydroxychloroquine, which is really easy to use. You know, the only thing you need is visual monitoring, you know, for people, you know, with hydroxychloroquine. Anything else that you could think of to treat this gentleman? So we talked about his nausea, we talked about his restless legs, we talked about his rheumatoid arthritis pain, right? Yeah, and that's what, what does clothing cause? Constipation. Christine got shaky with Tramacet. I threw up with Tylenol 3 and couldn't stop throwing up. Every time I have codeine, I throw up. Right? We have our personal experience, and you know, and that colors my view of codeine. <laughs> but it, 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 in an older person, the constipation is brutal. 90% of people can get constipated with it. So, this is how you can kind of map this together, right? We've got our assessment, and um, we've got our goals of care on the right his symptoms his function, his health care. And then, remember we talked about putting up a summary chart afterwards. And this is, this is how things unfolded with him, with this stop starting, uh, reducing and starting drugs. So we put him on the um, methotrexate, prednisone, and we only needed the prednisone for six weeks till the, pre till the methotrexate kicked in. And then I pulled the prednisone right out, and there was no problem, he didn't need any more. We used topical diclofenac for him as well as an adjunct treatment for some of his joints. Uh, I gave him Kenalog in one of his knees, which was a bad, you know, a particularly bad knee. <coughs> and we put him on vitamin D and calcium because anyone on prednisone, you know, long term, and most people with rheumatoid arthritis also have osteoporosis. If, he, if this guy had a, you thought his life expectancy was going to be more than a year, I would probably put him on a bisphosphonate as well because almost all these people, especially if the prednisone is going to continue. Uh, of people with chronic prednisone, more than five milligrams a day, um, the recommendations are to put them on a bisphosphonate if the life expectancy is going to be more than a year. So the impact was his, his uh, pain was much better, his mobility was better, he's walking to the dining room again with a walker, goal achieved, goal of care, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be independent, I, w I don't want to be dependent with my mobility, and he was toileting himself. He could move his hands, his wrists, and shoulders and he could wipe himself and handle his own toileting. Uh, the other pain he also had only in his, in his spine and sciatica, and we ended up using fentanyl um, with him because the constipation was such a problem, and uh, ended up going up to 25 micrograms every 72 hours. We gave him 100 milligrams of gabapentin at bedtime because of the radiculopathy and the restless leg syndrome. So besides levodopa and, um, and uh, agonists like Mirapex, Gabapentin is good for restless leg syndrome. You know, it's a good drug for restless leg syndrome. And we took him off the, uh, you know, once he got off the metoclopramide, his restless legs was much better. Um, we got rid of the, um, the uh, Tylenol-3, which has caffeine in it to help his sleep. And he slept better. The metoclopramide, we put him on iron, which iron deficiency makes restless legs worse, and put him on an iron supplement. <clears throat> With his confusion, we stopped his uh, oxybutynin and his codeine, his gravol, and um, the other th stuff will be on this slide because we're focusing mostly on pain with this gentleman. So just to bring this session to conclusion, the first part is that often pain in older people and people in, in frail people and people in care facilities, is they usually have pain in multiple sites and they're usually, usually multiple causes. Not always, but you know, be aware that it's not one pain with people, and this is where that OPQRST assessment, that good medical assessment and examination of the patient is useful. Be on the lookout for inflammatory pain. I presented a case the very first torch session about a lady with dementia and agitation who could not communicate, but every time you touched her, she screamed. And it wasn't because people were, it's because she had PMR, polymyodramatic, and when we put her on prednisone, you know, she stopped screaming with her ADL, and we cut her off all of her antipsychotic drugs she was in pain. So think about inflammatory pain, especially if people can't communicate. Uh, and it, um, the, f the f other thing is let patients prioritize, you know, what their priorities are and think about their symptoms, the impact on their function, and what their overall goals of care are. And I'd also like to mention it's rare that we're going to eliminate chronic pain. We manage chronic pain. 
And my goal is if I have people in the threes and fours who start out in the eights and nines, I'm happy. And they're happy. If you try and get the pain away, you have people who are drooling, sitting on the sides of their, their bed, and that the families are unhappy, they're unhappy, etc. So, you know, it's setting realistic goals of care. The other thing I'll mention with this is to use your other, use PT, use occupational therapy and positioning, use injections, use topicals, and be careful with constipation. You, you know, if you can use non-constipating narcotics, but if you do have to use constipating narcotics, put people, I, I, I use a lot of PEG. I don't think twice about using, you know, PEG. It's a safe, it works, people can tolerate it as long as they can swallow a glass at a time. Okay. Okay. Could you yes. talk about something? Okay. 15 milligrams, and because it's indicated for short term, yeah. and I see so many people on it, and it, the changes mm. of personality for long term use. So, yeah. so, so it's all, mm. you know, you know that we all say that sleep pills are bad. Sopical and oxy oxazepam, you know, mm. uh, you know, Ativan, things like that, they are cause problems, but there is a small group of people in my experience who they need them. This guy, I think, I don't remember, but I think is Opico, and we got him from 15 milligrams. Once he got rid of his restless legs, he slept a lot better, and gabapentin, he needed a very small amount, but, you know, some people, you know, I don't think Zopicone is worse than Oxazepam, and I don't think, you know, it's better than, you know, I think it's six of one, half dozen of the other, and it's individual. Some people do better with one drug or the other, so. Do you use much Desiree? No, I don't. Can I? I'm going to save that question, Chris, because I want to be mindful of time. But I'll talk after the break for anyone who um, has any questions. Okay. I want.